afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Sila Julie Abelgaard. She's a PhD student at the Copenhagen Business School, where she currently studies student teams working on innovative projects and entrepreneurial ideas in different educational studio spaces. Her research interests include the use of video analysis to study social interaction, specifically how materiality and spatiality are employed as communicative resources in social interaction such as creative processes, design projects, and educational activities. Would you please welcome Sile? Uh, this is Sile uh, Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Sile. So uh, in relation to the topic of this uh, session, I am focusing on team dynamics. And uh, like the presentation from Bo earlier, I have to also uh, um, say that this research is funded by the Independent Research Council in Denmark, and uh, I, uh, I will try to uh, guide you through. It's a bit of a different study. It's a qualitative study of a uh, display of individual idea ownership during group uh, brainstorming. So this idea it came to me when we talked a lot about how are we talking about ideas, and when we talk about ideas in everyday language, we use uh, sentences like, I have an idea, I got an idea, my idea is, and so on. And it seems uh, there's this common thing to attribute some sort of ownership to ideas and to identify ideas as belonging to someone when we talk about ideas. And this everyday talk indicates that ideas can be considered and treated as a cognitive phenomenon which can be owned. So there is this sort of ownership epistemology connected to the, to the idea of ideas. <laughs> Um, so this study, I will go back to the study design later, but it's based on uh, four hours of video recorded group, group brainstorming sessions. Um, yeah, and as you know, brainstorming is one of these many different creative methods for idea generation, where participants produce ideas, in this case on sticky notes, and share them in a group in order to come up with creative or novel solutions. The majority of studies on these uh, brainstorming sessions and idea generations are normally rooted in experimental research, where you, for example, compare productivity, uh, individuals produce more ideas than groups, and so on. But this study, um, I focus on language use and social interaction, and I apply this inter interactional perspective inspired by uh, conversation analysis and group in order to come up with creative So, um, my theoretical framework draws on the idea of psychological ownership and territory. And so in this term, I'm not talking about idea ownership in terms of uh, any legal matters or property or anything like that. It's, it's viewed at this, as this cognitive affective state that's very characteristic of being human. And I also draw on Goffman, Goffman's concept of territories of the self. Goffman studied a lot of uh, the implicit rules of our everyday interaction. And he believed, uh, he had this idea that in a Goffmanian framework that the self is not this constant size, but it is kind of like extended in our surroundings and, um, and we can kind of say that uh, the self exists in this non-spatial way, more like in our situational, egocentric way. And um, in, the, in, this, in can be also uh, in a conversational uh, place as well around us. So I brought this picture of the chair as this good example of we put a jacket on and then we kind of mark that the seat is reserved and we kind of have this idea that now this is my seat and if somebody would take that seat it would be pretty in a, uh, breaking a kind of a rule of everyday interaction. So that's why I brought this, that picture. So moving on to the study design. Um, I had, uh, we had uh, t uh, 38 university students participating in this study at master level and they were in a course on creativity and innovation. They were already working on a, on a project and uh, they were 22 female and 16 male in this study and they were already divided into groups so the groups were self-chosen so there was not the same number of participants in each group. Um, they had facilitators to guide the brainstorming sessions and they were handed out post-it notes uh, that were numbered uh, and had an individual color so we could track the post-it notes over time. And uh, this resulted in four hours of video data and photos. So just to give you an example of how the, the study looked, um, we had this two, uh, two camera setup where I used two GoPro cameras uh, with a wide angle lens. And one ca camera faced the students and also had a microphone. Uh, and the other one faced the whiteboard so we could track all this. 
And then all speech were transcribed turn by turn, and also photos were taken after each session, so we could do this complete transcript and follow the interaction as, as, it, as it unfolds. So just to give you an example of um, how So the before the students looked, went uh, we had this two, uh, to these brainstorming setup. sessions, the, yeah, they, they were instructed in the rules of brainstorming, which later on, um, as I will look into my conclusion, kind of affected the way that ownership unfolds or not unfolds. But the, ru the rules were, as you probably know them, defer judgment, strive for quality, uh, quantity, seek wild ideas and build on other ideas. So that was what they got to know before they started. So because I had video data, I have a lot of rich data and a lot of detailed data. So to break it down into something I could work with, I began, I began with a an, an linguistic analysis that was um, this quantification of all the verbal data from the transcript. And I used in vivo to, to create a linguistic uh, register. I also coded uh, all the idea proposals, so all the verbal idea proposals, and tried to look into the use of pronouns, verbs, and adjectives, and so on. And this gave me like a preliminary indicator that I could then follow in a more detailed interaction analysis of certain extracts, where I would do more like a detailed transcript uh, to understand the conversational turns and how the, the idea proposals are this um, are multimodal in their format, uh, composed of non-verbal and verbal and embodied texts. So, uh, in terms of design language and what, and what characterizes a design language, um, personal pronouns is found to be a very prominent part of speech in design processes compared to other domains and contexts we normally use nouns and verbs and adjectives more. Uh, so, if we look at design processes and also idea generation and concept development, pronouns may be more frequent since we talk a lot about people and they play a critical role. So, I found similar patterns in this, uh, in this data, but what about ownership? So, I turned to look at uh, self-orientated pronouns when the participants design their idea proposals. So, this is how I expected a lot of data would look like. So, this is a, this is a snapshot from, from some of the videos where we have a, a girl and she is saying, my idea is that you should have a website with an overview of all the countries where you have knowledge. So, this my idea was kind of what I imagine to be analyzing a lot of. But when I <laughs> coded the data uh, for all these uh, idea proposals, it uh, spread out in this way, and surprisingly, my was only frequent four times in the data. So this not so much to follow there. However, I looked into more this I. Um, where we have uh, yeah. <laughs> pronoun and uh, found that I write was very frequent. So I looked further into that. And then I began a more detailed analysis of what goes on. So this is an example of, uh, of somebody saying I have written eye scanner. For example, like it's like a laser where you can where it can check you. Yes, that's nice. So somebody's saying I have uh, written. Uh, and this seems to be a very normal way of uh, making an idea relevant in the context. And I found many examples of that. Of that. So uh, first of all, it indicates a new term. It indicates that the speaker is actually about to present an idea and not just something. And it also demonstrates that it's a relevant contribution. So in the context of a brainstorming session, what is written on the post note is in fact the idea. Um, I also uh, look into another example. I have many examples and you will have to look at the full study to get, to get the details of this, but this is just to give you an overview. This was another girl that, um, while she was putting up her red post notes on top of the blue one, she said, so I have exploited to place my own one up highest. And what was relevant here is she made it relevant in the situation to, to point out that she exploits how to place the post note on the whiteboard. So there seems to be this kind of hierarchical order in the idea, which may, in fact, emphasize there is some sort of ownership. But however, she also puts the sticky note on top of another post-it note. So my, there might be some, of course, they are related, but maybe there is a core idea in the first So those things I could follow as well, but um, I was also limited in, in my study here. But to come to the conclusions, uh, I guess also time is running. <laughs> Um, this study showed that ownership uh, rarely follows this classical ownership schema where the idea is verbally designed as my idea is or I have an idea. The most frequent used format in this uh, was this kind of you uh, pronoun that's more this generic you as opposed to a person specific pronoun. 
And what, I, what my analysis showed was that the rule of, rules of brainstorming are likely to influence the proportion of idea ownership, since there is this facilitated structure that creates a certain order where you present ideas turn by turn, and then you avoid critique. So even though you present an idea with ownership um, displays, it might not be treated as ownership, in fact, because uh, this instruction, deferred judgment, appeared to resonate very well with the interactional order amongst the participants. So this supports the idea behind the, the ideal behind brainstorming, namely that there is a collaborative and shared idea generation going on, and these rules may, in fact, reduce or minimize idea ownership in favor for this common goal. So in a future study, something I could look, look further into, which my result pointed uh, towards was this idea of materiality and embodiment, placement and color as another way of looking into idea ownership. Also tracking ideas over time in terms of how many times we tend to reference our own ideas. How many times do we select them for clustering? Do we, do we have like some kind of pet idea we don't want to kill? Also this, uh, this study was of course done in facilitated brainstorming sessions. So how does it look in the wild when ideas are not put on post-it notes and presented in a forum? following certain rules. And then also, uh, my analysis looked, uh, pointed towards this tendency amongst university students to distance themselves from uh, displaying ownership in a group context and minimize the self-praise and they use a lot of irony and it seems to be the fact that uh, they also minimize their academic competence in the social context. So maybe that could also be an explanation why there is very little idea ownership displayed in situations like that. So if you want to read more about the study, there's a chapter on this in this book as well. <laughs> um, and you can see the detailed uh, analysis as well of some of the uh, transcripts. But uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, um, Julia Fontinen is a senior researcher at the Hussle Platten Institute, the University of Potsdam. For more than a decade, she has studied design thinking as an approach to creativity and innovation. Her academic background is in psychology, neuroscience, and philosophy, and now for the third time in a row, very impressive. She joins the MIC conference and looks forward to a lively exchange. Would you please welcome Julia? Thank you for having me. So uh, welcome to this reflection about the resources that children versus adults bring to creative pursuits. The title also refers to a sense focus model about which you will hear more shortly. To begin with, we can observe how children tend to spend large portions of their time with creative activities. They indulge in imaginative play, make spontaneous creations in large numbers, curiously explore novel subjects and learn on the fly. At the same time as Giovanni Corazza noted in a personal correspondence, it seems striking how in the history of science and technology, all the major steps were taken by adults. So how can we reconcile these two observations about children versus adults excelling in creativity? For colleagues and me who practice design thinking, further clarifications in that regard seem specifically desirable, because design thinking invokes childlike approaches to such an extent that audiences often feel reminded of kindergarten or playground activities. It's not a rare memory when design thinking visionary Hasso Plattner recalls, I gave a talk at Potsdam about design thinking. Afterwards, someone from the audience remarked that everything I had been talking about sounded like what his daughter did in kindergarten. Hmm. At the same time, design thinking acknowledges the importance of professional expertise for high creative performance. Being advanced in one's university studies or even having completed one's degree is the best precondition to not only learn about design thinking, but make effective use of it. Adults excel in professional expertise, not children. So what resources do childlike versus adult approaches bring to creative pursuits? In that regard, design thinking theory has some straightforward proposals to make, which are summarized in the sense focus model of creative mastery. So in the history of design thinking, several authors have described two roads to creation. And today I will suggest that one road coincides with a childlike approach, whereas the other is a typical adult approach. And in terms of effects, these authors agree that one road enables creative leaps or heightened creativity, whereas the other typically entails highly sophisticated, polished, and perfected outcomes. That is to say, one road entails radical innovation and the other incremental innovation. And since these authors have used many different terms to describe the two roads, we have condensed core phrases in the sense focus model of creative mastery. So in a sense mode, people are said to explore new ways of seeing, hearing, feeling, and experiencing. They let loose, do what feels right, act spontaneously, humorously, and playfully. They use unstructured approaches, follow their intuitions, impulses, and curiosities. In a focus mode, people are said to engage in rational planning. They reflect, analyze, and synthesize based on deep domain expertise. They exit metacognitive control and meta-rationalities, and they use structured approaches. Now, sense mode activity can be nicely observed in child play, not only in child play, but also here. Here, the kids do what feels right. They act spontaneously instead of planning long ahead. They freely explore what they get to see and hear and feel. They follow their intuitions, impulses, and curiosities. By contrast, focus mode activity can be best observed in professionally trained adults, or so I think. Adults plan ahead. They reflect, analyze, and synthesize based on deep domain expertise. They exit metacognitive control and follow through with structured approaches. So against this background, now let's dive deeper into the subject of creativity turning, in particular, to the creative process. Here is a model of the creative process sketched by Tim Brannan. It's often cited, at least in design thinking traditions, and it's sometimes discussed critically because it doesn't seem to provide much clarity about the steps creators take or should take in order to achieve good creative outcomes. However, I find this model very fruitful when coupled with further interpretation. And one possible interpretation I want to propose today is in terms of motion paths. So I invite you to see the model as an ideal combination of two motion patterns. One path that is typical for adults and another path that is typical for children. When adults want to get from A to some distant goal point B, they typically pre-plan their path. 
taking the shortest distance is time and energy efficient. And then adults often barely notice things to the side. And when something disrupts the path, this is often perceived as a nuisance, and adults quickly recalculate the path so as to overcome the obstacle. Walking paths of children are different. In the image, you see my son Lenny, who attended a nursery on the university campus. And you can surely imagine how walking routes of Lenny or also other children would be very different from my colleagues' walking routes. So when my colleagues want to get from A to B, for instance, to hold a lecture in a different building, they typically take the straightest path possible. Lenny, however, would run here or there. Oh, there's a light stick in the park. Let's go and grab it. And oh, there's a nice flower to the other side. Let's go and smell it. So we, these walking routes could lead anywhere, but not necessarily to a distant point B. So let's explore this motion metaphor in further detail, and please be, pre please be prepared, it will be a fast-paced tour, we only have 12 minutes. So I will suggest some directions of thought, and then you're invited to take the thoughts further or to review them critically. First, let's consider motion in straightforward terms. Might there be some connection between motion paths and creative performance? There are by now many studies that show an, um, an impact of motion on creativity. In the experiment quoted here, participants in one condition walk around freely, whereas in another condition, they follow the straight lines of a rectangle. Afterwards, participants in the free walking condition show increased creative performance compared to the other group. So by means of impression, heightened creativity appears on the yarn ball side. In the next step, let's consider the two motion paths in terms of the sense focus model. Here, um, the yarn ball motion path can be interpreted as creative activity in the sense mode, well observable also in child play. Such exploratory processes often lead to the discovery of unanticipated opportunities. This approach courts serendipity. The straight arrow motion path, to me, represents creative activity in a focus mode. Best to be observed in professionally trained adults. Um, this approach benefits from extreme insistence. All efforts are orchestrated around goals that may lie far in the future, and deep domain expertise helps to approximate perfection around the envisioned goal. Thirdly, Interpreting the creative process as a motion path raises a question of orientation. When people choose a path, how do they orient themselves and make choices? Notably, to pre-plan the shortest A to B path, adults need an initial cognitive map. Such a map would also help to know what is off track and can therefore be ignored as irrelevant. By contrast, the motion path of children does not seem to require an initial cognitive map that overviews the whole terrain. It's enough to be aware of the immediate environment where you can approach things that interest you. However, what will happen is that by trying things out here and there, gradually the child will develop her own unique cognitive map. Then, for the motion path of children, emotions are all important. Is the child more passionate about sticks and therefore turns to the park? Or is he maybe more passionate about vehicles and therefore turns to the parking lot? I point this out for two reasons in particular. First, Sergio Agnoli and Giovanni Corazza recently <coughs> noted a lacking recognition of the guiding role that emotions play during creative press. Oh, but, oh yes. For adults, I, I should say for adults, um, emotions, or for this straight arrow path, the shortest A to B path, emotions seem to, seem to be just less important because we can easily imagine 10 adults with different emotions and they still select the same A to B path based on a common cognitive map and efficiency optimization. So we have this difference. And I point this out for the two reasons I just um, alluded to, namely that the, the role of emotions is actually an issue. Rarely we encounter models and theoretical frameworks considering emotional reactions as main determinants of the creative process. And with this motion path metaphor, we can acknowledge the guiding role of emotions even at fine granular levels of analysis. That is, specifically in sense mode activity, emotions likely shape each and every turn in the creative process path. The second reason why I bring this up is because radical innovation is often understood as a process where people develop new conceptual spaces that divert from old views and paradigms of thought. Now, from a physiological perspective, it seems to be the case that brain structures used by all mammals to maneuver through physical spaces are reused by humans to also maneuver through conceptual spaces. And as a thought, wouldn't it be 
or yeah, cognitive maps are encoded in the hippocampal formation and related regions and range from the spatial to the purely conceptual. So against this background, wouldn't it be exciting if maybe we could observe the development of new conceptual spaces in the brain? And in that regard, maybe the hippocampal formation and related regions could be a good place to look at, I don't know. Um, yeah, you mentioned more about that. Further questions include, do people who engender incremental innovation exhibit rather stable cognitive maps, whereas people who advance radical innovation dynamically form new maps during the creative process? And also from a methodological perspective, creative activity in a sense mode could be a means to foster the development of new and valid conceptual spaces. That would be analog to children who develop a new cognitive map based on personal experiences made in the field. Then a fourth and related concern, how about attention? When people take the straight arrow motion path, their attention can often be narrow. So the focus lies on B and then information to the side is discarded as irrelevant, and when something extraneous does become important, it is often perceived as a nuisance, such as an obstacle that enforces a detour. Hmm. By contrast, in the case of the um, yarn ball motion path, attention will often be wide, so as to overview options and find the next interesting thing. Attention can also be leaky, so you focus on one thing and then something else enters your awareness, so you turn to the side and you turn again and again, and thus quite possibly never reach a distant point B. And since I was indicated, um, yeah, so just the empirical findings in that regard, here people with a large breadth of attention and leaky filters show increased creative performance, so once more, by means of impression, we find heightened creativity on the yarn ball side, and fittingly, um, attention also seems to be more narrow and selective in adults compared to children. So for reasons of time, uh, you won't hear about uh, room designs for uh, creativity. And I finish with um, the basic idea. That is, we might want to encourage more motion paths um, of a yarn ball type or childlike approaches for creative purposes. We surely want to continue to build on professional adult skills and a long-term focus in the pursuit of goals. The happy blending of childlike and adult approaches may indeed be a good model for ra uh, successful radical creativity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, do we have any questions in the room, please? Julia, beautiful presentation, beautiful model and hypothesis. Three things I want to say. First thing is that uh, it's not clear cut adult and child Absolutely. because we as adults yeah. preserve qualities and attitudes of children and that's what we should uh, emphasize, as you say, in the end. Sometimes you get to B and then you have to come back to A. So it's not always in that direction yeah. forward. It could also be backward. And the third uh, thing is you could also think of personality in one of the arrows, maybe the sixth arrow, personality, because openness, openness to experience, leads to this doodle yeah. trajectory and vice versa. So yeah. just to build on what you said. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Yeah. yeah. shout a lot anyway so I thought that you heard me but you know there's great great variability the children think differently they don't think in one way so you can't really say that this is a child way of thinking and this is an adult way of thinking so it's very you know whatever that, that, that's extreme you know showing the direction towards more creative thinking is good but you know children are much much more complicated than that you have different kinds of children yeah and it's just a, a metaphor and I have 12 minutes to introduce a metaphor so I make it bold. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you.
Here we are. Okay, Alessandro Salvo is a product and service system designer. His interest is on the design thinking approach to define innovation strategies, analyzing user needs. He is currently finishing an internship, internship at ID Activity Center, a research center for creativity driven innovation through design within the Politecno di Milano. He has contributed to the development of the framework for analyzing and clustering digital design tools. Would you please welcome Alessandro? Thank you, thank you for the presentation. And good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. I don't know, but anyway. Uh, I'm Alessandro, and I'm, today I'm here with uh, the Professor Smerita Canina and the PhD candidate Carmen Bruno. Um, and I'm going to share with you this uh, digital creativity tools framework that we developed. Um, we are a research group at the Activity Center um, with the aim of um, developing methodologies to empower all the different steps uh, of our creative design process through design research, uh, through studies on creativity, and um, through a human-centered approach, striving always for innovation. Um, uh, the framework I will present you today is only a, a small part of a wider research um, that the group uh, have done in these last years um, concerning mainly the evolution of technology uh, and the impact it has had uh, both on society and uh, on creativity, especially the relation that uh, this last has within the design field. Um, Speaking about uh, digital technologies, uh, I think we are all agree when I say that uh, we are facing a digital transition. Uh, a digital tra a transition that is uh, uh, mainly affecting, I think, um, a lot of elements inside the design field. First of all, the way of working of designers and non-designers. Uh, secondly, um, it is affecting not only products and services, uh, but also the way we design products and services, so the creative design process, with its tools and models that are, uh, let's say, boosted uh, thanks to these new ed 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 digital technologies. Um, for, for this reason, we developed this framework and we, with the aim of, uh, first of all, identifying a uh, cluster and to uh, analyze all the online-based digital tools that could support in any way the creative design process, starting right away uh, from our uh, design process that is a, a that one. In two slides, I will explain you uh, how it is. Uh, this is the structure of the framework. Um, we started from our uh, background knowledge uh, about uh, design thinking, about uh, uh, the creative design process, then we needed to define the criteria for the analysis of these tools that could support the design process. And then we ended uh, with our tools hunting, uh, and then we needed to position these tools inside our framework. Uh, this structure is also the structure of the, the, uh, the slides now on. And so let's check it. Um, yeah, as I've just said, uh, this is the, the, the design process. Uh, this is our, um, yeah, the ID activity process, uh, divided uh, in two main areas, explore and generate. And uh, for developing our framework, we needed to uh, change it a bit. Uh, in fact, we designed a new shape, uh, a double diamond shape, maintaining the two main areas, explore and generate. Um, in these two main areas, we, um, we identified uh, two uh, and two, so four in total new phases. Uh, we have clarified goal, define opportunities, ideate and prototype. In the first phase, we need to understand better the problem we have. We have to explore all uh, the sort of information we, we can gather. Then we, we need to define opportunities and, and so we have to converge into a brief into a design challenge in order then to uh, explore it in the third phase, in the ideation phase, where we have to con uh, conceive a lot of ideas and then uh, selected one or more uh, to prototype later in the last phase of, pro of uh, yes, of prototyping, uh, ending with a solution. And this process is very important, is we have to re repeat it again and again. Um, now, how might this, the, 
a second step. How might we define the criteria for the tool selection? Um, we, we started from uh, an, ex an extensive literature review um, with the purpose of um, searching for criteria, for design principles, for a creative aspect that a digital tool should support inside, within the creative design process. Um, we, we selected uh, three main re researches done by Ben Schneiderman uh, that we took as a scientific reference for our framework, for building our framework, um, where uh, Ben Schneiderman uh, studied and, and analyzed how to design uh, digital tools that in, in any way could support uh, creativity inside the design process. This is a list of some of them, and we um, took in, co in consideration this one, um, and then we needed to transform them into uh, our three main criteria for the framework. The first one is design process activities, the second one is the tool selection criteria, and the third one is, uh, uh, sorry, tools, uh, tools cross ca characteristics, sorry. Um, starting for, from the, the first one, we, here we have again the four phases of the design process uh, and ten activities that are um, supporting these four phases. Starting from the first one, we have uh, to search for information. I, uh, I have j uh, it just said, then we have uh, to empathize with the users. We have to empathize with the needs of the, user, of the uh, users, and then we have to clusterize all the data we gathered, and we have to visualize them into a, a meaningful way. In the second phase, we have to open the possibilities, so we have to see uh, all the possible implications of a solution in order to build up a scenario uh, or a, a future event for our project. In the, last, in the third phase, we have to be inspired. We have to uh, conceive the much uh, idea as possible, and then we have to select one or two in order to prototype them uh, in the last phase uh, with the making activities and also the reflecting. That means uh, to share, to disseminate our solution with users, with stakeholders, in order to, get, to gather feedbacks also in this phase. Um, as you can see here, we positioned these 10 characteristics under the uh, double diamond shape and under the four uh, main phases. Going on, um, the second criteria uh, are the tools selection criteria. We, um, we used uh, these three uh, criteria as uh, entering filters uh, for our uh, digital tools. The first one is uh, meta design. Meta design is a notion, is an approach that um, allows, in any way, uh, users to, to act as designers, even if uh, or without being, uh, for example, a skilled computer expert. Um, on the other hand, we have low threshold and high ceilings. This means that the, um, that the tools uh, should allow, um, for example, uh, novices uh, to use the tools without, uh, uh, no, it would giving them a, 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 an immediate confidence with, with the tools. Uh, and then at the same time, high ceilings means that the, the tools uh, should uh, be also uh, a possible for expert to work on with uh, a complex solution, for example. Um, these are the last criteria, uh, are the cross car car characteristics of the uh, tools. Uh, we define this for uh, because uh, now we can compare also the tools we put into the, the framework. Uh, the first one is collaboration. We have co-creation, rich history keeping, and relate and interact. The first one means that the, sh the tool has a an environment in which uh, team members, colleagues can share information, work together. The second one means that the uh, tools are mainly for facilitator that wants to build up uh, co-design uh, activities or co-design session. The third one is, it means that the tools um, have the, has the, uh, the possibility to record all the, my previous m ideas, my previous projects, my previous modifications, so I can go back and bring uh, these ideas. Um, concluding, the last is relate and interact. That means that the, the tools could help me uh, uh, to communicate with a peers, experts, or even a community, a bigger community. Um, then, this is the, the, the framework. 
uh, apart. Uh, we, we cluster more than 50 online-based digital tools. Um, and we started from uh, this kind of, of visualization. Uh, as you can see, we have, again, the double diamond process. We have the four phases with the descriptions. Uh, we have the 10 activities, tasks, with that description. And then we started placing the tools uh, inside uh, um, their acti activity of application. This means that, it, that f uh, for example, these first uh, four uh, tools uh, uh, solves uh, the first, the searching activities, the clustering uh, and visualizing, and the last one, re reflecting. Here we have an, an example, this, this is shape, uh, a tool developed by IDEO. Um, this is the cell um, where we, we have put uh, all the tools. We have, um, in this case, collaboration, rich history keeping, and relate and interact with the description and also the link of the tool. Um, concluding, um, we know that, uh, that, that this is only a, a first step of a wider research. Um, we doesn't have the ambition of cluster all the, uh, of all the digital tools that now exist in the, in the world, but we started to think about, yeah, uh, to, to think about the first re relations with the, uh, within the, design creative process and these, di and these digital tools. And next steps will be to test some of these tools inside, for example, a real design environment with those physical tools maybe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Do we have any questions, please? Hi, Pat, Northwestern, uh, North Central, sorry. Yeah. Um, these tools are very helpful when we're dealing collaborative, a, when we're not in the same time frames. Yeah. But can your hyper content that you're trying to load into the knowledge base mm -hmm. be prevented from having new ideas introduced by the design of your system? And how is that factored in? Yeah, we, we thought that we have a lot of tools and for sure um, not all the tools can support in the same way all the phases of the creative design process. Um, we have, for example, some tools that uh, solves only one, for example, uh, or others like uh, Shape. Shape is a tool, is an interface in which I can work from the first, first phase, from the searching for, inf uh, yes, for information, for example, the end. I can also uh, share the final outcomes with the communities inside the same platform. So we have this, yeah, a different relation and different, uh, yes, relation between all these uh, tools. And we try now to, to, to see this kind of, of differences uh, uh, inside the framework. Here we have a, a, a small, I get, the, a, this is a, a small picture, but here, for example, these tools are in one, two, three, four, and five phases of them. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I think it's time for lunch. Yeah. <laughs>